In this section, second session, we're going to continue to look at what Elijah's journey has to teach us about our own journey by looking at part two of Elijah's trip into the wilderness. In the first session, we explored how our weaknesses are an opportunity to experience God's own strength. And we discovered how God's word is a key source of strength for our journey. And I want to continue to unpack how the power of God's word not only sustains us, but also begins to shape and shift our perspective. But let's start off first of all by reading 1 Kings 19, 9 to 18. And the word of God says this. At that place, he came to a cave and he spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting the mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord says to him, go, Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king of Aram. You should also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Maloah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. In the last session, I asked you to picture Elijah standing alone on Mount Carmel, 450 prophets of Baal on one side, him standing alone on the other, surrounded by a crowd of people watching on with eager anticipation. When God asked Elijah the poignant question, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's clear from his response that he feels singled out, that he feels alone, that he feels disregarded, isolated and abandoned. He says, I alone am left. He has been zealous for the Lord. He has been doing the Lord's work, but the result of being a friend of God and an enemy to the world has left him isolated, lonely. And I detect in his response an edge of resentment, an edge of accusation, almost like he is saying, Lord, I have done all of this for you and yet you've left me alone and you've left me in danger and you've left me vulnerable. Have you ever felt resentful? Resentful when the source of your suffering seems to be in some way linked to your allegiance to God? I want to think for a moment again about Corrie and her sister Betsy. They lose their freedom because they're doing God's work, God's work of protecting the Jews, those who are being persecuted by the Nazis. She's suffering terribly because of her obedience in following in the footsteps of Jesus. And it's not hard to see how in these types of situations, it's easy for resentment to creep in and to take root in our hearts. We can think, Lord, but I'm serving you. Why am I sick? Lord, I'm zealous for you. Why is it that uh, I'm being persecuted or mistreated at work? Lord, I love you. Why is my marriage falling apart? I feel so alone. I feel so abandoned. And I believe that Elijah was burnt out. He had been zealous for the Lord, literally calling down fire from heaven. And yet his fire, 
his zeal is, has burnt out. Now he's feeling discouraged. Now he's feeling depressed and it's all affecting his perspective. I want you to imagine for a moment traveling down a country lane. There's dust in the air and the dust is clinging to your windscreen and it's obscuring the way ahead. You can't see and you're trying to clear the windscreen but you don't have any water left in the car and so just little small squirts of water are coming out and so rather than clearing the windscreen it's just making it muddier it's just making it more difficult for you to be able to see if you're in this type of situation getting lost or going the wrong way is probably the least of your worries if you don't stop if you don't pull over it's likely that you're going to crash and I believe it's the same with the traumas and the trials that we experience in life. It can make us make it really hard for us to see. It can begin to cloud our vision if these things aren't cleared away. That's how I see Elijah's perspective. He's not able to see things clearly because of all that's happening to him, because of the weight of the responsibility. And so rather than being able to continue on with his journey he's having to pull over he's having to take a detour he's having to put a pause on the mission so that he's able to get a different and new perspective you see a faulty perspective is not always the cause of depression or discouragement we know that the causes of depression are numerous and complex there could be anything from a chemical imbalance to trauma Yet in Elijah's example, it's this discouragement, it's this, this, this depression is caused by his inability to see clearly. His inability to see clearly because Elijah says, I alone am left. But we have to ask ourselves the question, is this really true? Well, in order to answer that, we have to go back to 1 Kings chapter 18. In 1 Kings chapter 18, it records a meeting between Elijah and Obadiah. Obadiah is the palace administrator of Ahab, Ahab being the husband of Jezebel, the king at that time. Obadiah is a believer. He believes in Yahweh. And in fact, he is he has been used by God to protect over a hundred prophets who did not worship Baal. He hides them in caves, 50 in one cave, 50 in the other cave. And when Obadiah meets Elijah, he shares this with him. And so Elijah is aware that there's not only Obadiah who worships Yahweh, but a hundred prophets of God that were saved. And yet Elijah still considers himself to be alone. Did he discount them because they were not directly confronting the wicked system that Jezebel was building? Did he look down on Obadiah because he worked within the system that Elijah was working so hard to tear down? We may never fully know the answer. But what we do know is that God allowed Elijah to take a detour into the wilderness. But he gave him strength to travel further into the wilderness so that he could be led into an encounter with God that would give him a new perspective, that would give him God's perspective and an opportunity for his own to be shifted and to be shaped. Even though Elijah was running, running away from danger, running away from his assignment in a way, he was running towards an encounter with God. And it is in this encounter that he would receive the strength that he needs to be able to travel the road ahead. Elijah needed a glimpse of God's perspective. And he needed it as a corrective to his own. In God asking him the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? There is a suggestion that Elijah is finding himself in a place that he ought not to be. But before Elijah could move on from where he was, he had to take stock. He had to understand how he had arrived at the place that he was at. And so God tells Elijah to go out and to stand on the mountain so that he could pass by. This imagery of being on the mountain and having God pass by is so reminiscent of Moses. And in fact, Moses encounters God on the mountain multiple times in the scriptures. Mountains are often places of revelation in the Bible, places where God reveals himself to his servants, giving them an insight into his will, but also into his person. And it's, if we remember, it's on a mountain where Peter, James and John see Jesus transfigured before their eyes, see him as his glory 
glorified self and see him talking with Elijah and Moses as they hear the audible voice of God. Elijah too hears God's voice. But not only God's voice, he also communicates. God also communicates with him through a dramatic demonstration. A demonstration designed to help Elijah see more clearly. Elijah sees wind causing rocks to be splintered before him. There is an earthquake and there is fire, like the fire that he called down from heaven to consume the sacrifice. But the scripture says that God isn't in any of these three noisy, disrupted, obvious displays of power. No, instead it says that there was a sound of sheer silence. And when Elijah hears it, He recognizes the presence of God and he finally comes out of the cave. It's strange really to consider how one can hear silence. Some versions of the Bible will translate this as a still small voice, but sheer silence is thought to be a more accurate translation of the Hebrew. When you think about it, when you think about the noise that we're surrounded by in the world, even when there is so-called silence, there is always that background noise, the quiet hum of electronic devices, the subtle blowing of the wind, the gentle hum of nature. And so if there was no sound at all, if there was sheer silence, we would hear it or rather we would notice the absence of sound and this is what happens to Elijah and when he hears it he recognizes the presence of God within it and he goes to the entrance of the cave just as God asked him to initially and God says to him again what are you doing here Elijah and Elijah gives the very same answer. It seems that he's not quite yet grasping what God is showing him, but God would go on to make it plain. Why don't we explore for a moment what it is God was showing him in these dramatic displays of power and then in that sheer silence? You see, Elijah was so used to God using him in very visible and dramatic ways. He was so used to confronting the evil system up front and head on. He spoke truth to power. He didn't mince his words. He said it wouldn't rain for three years and it didn't rain. He calls down fire from heaven and he takes matters into his own hands and kills 450 prophets of Baal. This is what Elijah recognizes as God working these dramatic displays of power. And yet... Those working behind the scenes, those working quietly in the system, he discounts. God was clearly with Elijah. We see this through these dramatic acts. And yet God was also equally present in the silence. This is what God was showing him on the mountain. He was showing him that God isn't only present in dramatic, dynamic, disruptive acts. But God is also present in sheer silence, in ways it's hard to see and difficult to perceive. He might look down on the prophets hiding in caves, but now he's hiding in his own cave. All the zeal had taken a toll on him. It's not that it was wrong, but he had taken a toll. And it was time for him to enter into God's presence to receive the renewal that he so desperately needed. You see, when I was preparing for the message today, I felt that God really wanted me to make sure that we all understood this one thing. You are not alone. You see, Elijah became discouraged and he became depressed because from his perspective, he was alone. His strength failed because he felt alone. But God wanted Elijah to know that he was not the only one left, that God had 7,000 people in Israel that had not abandoned his way, that had not worshipped Baal. That even though it felt like darkness was overpowering him, that darkness was overcoming the nation, that God still had a plan, that God still had purpose and that God's plan had not failed, that, that darkness could not win. And I believe God wants us to know that too. You see, when we look at all the things that are going on in the world, when we look at this journey that we're on, 
called life and we see all the disruption and the discouragement it can be easy for us to think that thing darkness is taking over but God's saying no I am still in control I have still got my faithful remnant those that will not serve the purposes of other gods those that call upon my name that believe in the name of Jesus God wants us to know that even though the darkness feels like it's drawing in on us he is with us he is with us and though life can seem lonely at times demanding and overwhelming at times we do not walk this journey alone one of the most beautiful things that i observe in this story is the grace of god when elijah is running away he runs into the presence of god He's trying to escape the mission, but he's running right towards the arms of the father. And it reminds me of what David says in Psalms 139 verses seven and eight. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go down, go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. He couldn't escape the presence of God. And even when he was clearly wrong, clearly misunderstood what God was doing in a place where he ought not to have been. God lovingly and gently corrects him. Before he even challenges his perspective, he makes sure that he has strength for the encounter. You see, God not only gives Elijah a new perspective, but he also gives Elijah three new assignments. Elijah was told to anoint two kings, one a pagan king, the other a king that would rule in Israel. And he was also told to anoint his successor, Elisha. This is significant. God allows him to vent. He allows him to rest. He gives him a glimpse of his own perspective, but then he recommissions him for his mission. Elijah was trying to run away from the mission. He wanted to be wanted it to be over. He felt too weak to finish. He felt like a failure, but God shows him in a wilderness place, in a barren place that is not finished with him yet. God shows him that there's still work for him to do. You see, the version of Elijah that enters the wilderness is not the same Elijah that leaves it. He has an encounter with God that changes him, that reinvigorates him, that gives him strength to be able to continue the journey. It's not that the version that leaves the wilderness is somehow a super Elisha, is not without defect, is not perfect, it's just stronger. You see, one of the things that we have to realize about the assignments that Elijah is given is that it doesn't complete them all before he's taken up to be with God. No, it's Elijah that, Elijah that was sent to, Elijah doesn't anoint Jehu even though that was one of his assignments it's a junior prophet that's sent by Elisha that anoints Jehu and I say this to say that even though Elijah doesn't do everything perfectly he still finishes his journey in triumph he still finishes his journey in glory it says in the scriptures that he is taken up to heaven by the chariots of Israel, the angel armies of God come and escort him into the presence of God. Why is this important? It is important because Elijah's failures, his limited perspective, his weaknesses, they do not disqualify him for service. God was still able to use him in spite of all these things because God deeply cared for him and he deeply loves God. You see, God was well able to give Elijah what he needed to complete and finish his journey. And the same is true for us. God is able to give us what we need. Our failures do not need to be final. Our weaknesses do not need to lead to our disqualification. Sometimes we are like Elijah. We may take a detour. We may go the opposite way to our mission. We may just need to sit down and rest a little while. But the rest is not the same thing as retiring. You see, Elijah wanted to retire. He wanted to give up. He wanted the journey to be over. But God said, you may have had enough. But when you have had enough, I am still enough. And God is saying that to us. You may have had enough, but you are, but God, I am still enough, God says. And he's showing us there's a time for retirement, but there's also a time for rest. 
And we have to be able to discern in the presence of God what the time is. Have you ever felt like you've had enough? Had enough of work? Had enough of your marriage? Had enough of the church that you go to? Had enough of seeing another report on the news about some kind of violent or vicious act? Well, when we have had enough, God is still saying, I am enough. And you don't have to walk away from your assignment permanently. Maybe you just need to take a rest. You see, all or nothing thinking can have us planning our retirement from God's mission. When God is just saying, rest in my presence, reset in my presence, allow me to shift your perspective in my presence. Trusting in God's ability and willingness to guide us is the thing that we need to have strength for the journey. When we have had enough, God is still saying, I am enough. See, resting in God's plan is also trusting that God still has a plan for you. And not just for you, but for his world. One of Elijah's shortcomings, one of the things that was his kind of thorn in his side was thinking that God's plan started and ended with him, that somehow if, if he failed, that somehow God's plan would fail. But that was not the case. God's plan was bigger than him. It didn't rely upon him solely. And so Elijah, being overwhelmed by evil, the evil gripping the, la- the nation, lost sight of God's sovereignty, lost sight of the fact that God was still in control, that he had strategically placed people in positions to help the plan to overthrow the darkness that was gripping the nation. And he also had someone that would succeed Elijah lined up already. He may have begun the work, but there would be someone else that would continue the work. And this wasn't about Elijah being replaceable. It wasn't about him simply being a pawn in God's plan, but it was rather about God's ability to execute his plans in spite of our human weaknesses. And so at the height of our distress and in the depths of our discouragements, and when life can seem irredeemable, God wants us to know that he's still redeeming. He's still bringing new life. He's still working out his plans and his purposes. We don't have to know God's plan, but we just have to trust that he has one. And it's when we remain in the presence of God, despite our limitations, the limits of our understanding, the limits of our misgivings and shortcomings, that God provides us the strength that we need to keep going. See, having strength the journey is not about having all the answers it's not about being perfect but it is about having an encounter with God and it's through encounter it's through our personal and private encounters with God that we gain the strength that we need you see Elijah had public encounters with God He has seen manifestations of God that were powerful in public places. And yet these things weren't enough to sustain him when trouble came his way. No, when trouble came his way, when he felt down and when he felt defeated, it was a personal and private encounter with God that gave him what he needed to continue. And that's why no matter where you are in your journey, no matter whether you've taken a detour or whether you're on the path that you ought to be on. We always need to be realizing that our destination ultimately is God. Our destination is being led deeper into the presence of God. That God is not only the one who provides direction, but he is the final and ultimate destination. That on this journey that we are on, even though it's easy sometimes to feel like we are traveling alone, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, is our companion on this journey. There are two things that I just want to remind us of as I come to the end of this message. Firstly, it's this, our weaknesses are simply an opportunity for us to experience God's strength. God in Christ subjected himself for a time to human limitations so that through his suffering, we could become our strength. Through his suffering, he could become the strength that we need. This leads me on to the second thing that we ought to remember, and that is we are not alone. Jesus, through the incarnation, through becoming fully human, is our Emmanuel. He is God with us. 
He doesn't run away from the mess, doesn't run away from our pain, from our brokenness. No, he runs towards it with healing in his wings. And rather than running away from Jesus when things get hard, I want to encourage us to run towards him, to run towards God who is already running towards us. Let me end with some words from scripture. One of my favorite verses is found in Isaiah 40 and it's verses 28 to 31. And the word of God says this, do you not know? Have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow weary or, or tired and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint for it is in God it is within him the one who cannot grow weary the one who is never tired the one whose wisdom is unfathomable it is in him that we find the strength that we need for our journey we're now going to have a time of reflection a time to pray into some of what God has spoken to you through this message. And there's some questions that I want you to consider. What are you doing here? Put your name in that sentence. So I would say, what are you doing here, Leone? The second thing, when you think about what you're doing here, it's not about being necessarily in the wrong place, but rather how you have arrived at this place in your life. Do you sense that you're in the right place. Secondly, how do you sense God shaping and shifting your perspective? And finally, what's one thing that's really resonated with you from what has been shared today? God bless you and keep you. And I pray that this message has encouraged you and given you some food for thought. God bless you. Let me just pray a blessing over us all. It's been wonderful to be here with you. And um, I pray that you were blessed. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time of refreshing, of connecting with one another, but also with you. And I pray, Lord, like Elijah, that the word that we've received here, Lord, the bread that we've received, Father God, that it will sustain us for the journey ahead. We don't know, Lord, necessarily where we are going, but we know that, Father God, that you walk with us and that we're journeying deeper and deeper into your presence. And so I pray, Father God, that everything that any woman here has need of, that she will find it in your presence, that, Father God, she would be comforted, that she would be strengthened, that she would be resourced, that she would be resilient, that, Father God, she would find her recovery in you. And we pray this in no other name, but the mighty and the precious name of Jesus. Amen.